channel of your peace where there is hatred let me bring your love where there is hurry, pardon Lord and where's the star true faith in you a master grant that I may to consult as to console to be understood as to understand to be loved as to love with all my soul make me a channel of your peace where there's despair let me bring hope where there is darkness only light and where there's darkness ever joy a master grant that I may never see so much to be consoled as to to be understood as to understand to be loved as to love with all my soul make me a channel of your peace it is in pardoning that we are Dying that we're born to eternal life. Good afternoon. Christ Church welcomes you all here today. Some of you have been at the crematorium and others have just come. Please note this is a service of thanksgiving for Christopher John Wooten. We've already committed Chris to Christ at the crematorium. After the service, the family invites you to stay for refreshments in the top hall. We have come together in the presence of God and in the name of Christ. We come with sorrow, but also with hope to express loss, but also to give thanks, to recognise death, but also to celebrate life, to look back at all that has been, but also to look forward to all that is yet to be. Come then in faith, for God is here, the God that has promised that in life or in death, he is with us. The God who gives all, his grace and eternal blessing. 
Let us stand together and sing the, the words of the first hymn, which is in Christ alone. They are in your service of order book, but they will also be on the screen. Yep, they're on the screen. Let us sing in Christ alone. and Marjorie Wooten in Banbury and lived there until he moved to Hayes at 10 months old when his dad, a wood machinist, got a job at EMI. I remember this being an excuse for stopping in Banbury if we were ever heading up north on holiday to have a Banbury cake and he would always mention that his mum worked in Brown's the Bakers from when she left school at 12. His was a happy childhood with his older brother Roger until war broke out in 1939. Living in Hayes, he was not eligible for evacuation, and therefore, if you ask him what he remembers of his school days, he would invariably mention air raids, and he would often blame Hitler for damaging his education and preventing him from becoming a doctor. Although many of you do know him as Doc, so maybe his dream did come true after all. 
At age seven, he started collecting stamps, a hobby that were to last a lifetime and a window to the world in terms of history and geography. His dad, Fred, was too old to serve in the Second World War, having first served, served in the first, somehow surviving Ypres, Passchendaele and the Somme, so the family were not separated as some were. Fred worked hard digging for victory in their allotment, and Marjorie was a wonderful cook, ensuring her two growing boys never went hungry, even through those many years of rationing, which I understand were supplemented by basketfuls of fresh Welsh eggs each time Claude, her brother-in-law, came up from Tembe to do secret work in the ministry. Nights were often broken, spent in the air raid shelter, built in the back garden, emerging each morning to survey the damage. One night at the height of the blitz, he was taken out into his garden and he could see this red glow in the sky. It was London on fire, 17 miles away. Chris was 12 when peace came, celebrated by a VE Day street party. He continued his education at Townfield School where he excelled in practical subjects. A table he made in woodwork is still in daily use at home. At 14, in 1948, he joined the 9th Hayes Air Scouts because two lads from school badgered him to join and Roger joined too. Two weeks later, he went on his first camp to St Margaret's Bay in Dover. He left school at 15 and started work in the Ealing branch of Sainsbury's. He could never have imagined then that he would work for the same firm until retirement. Sainsbury's then was a very different shop to now, more akin to your corner shop where Dad learnt to pat butter and slice bacon. He always used this as an excuse for not doing dirty jobs like gardening or mending the car as he didn't want to get dirt under his fingernails. At 17, he had a very serious operation on his back which kept him in hospital for many weeks and while, while it healed. And maybe this reignited his interest in medicine, as when it was time for national service, he chose to do three years rather than the compulsory two, so he could choose what he did. Because of his involvement with the Air Scouts, he chose the RAF and to work as a nursing assistant. This involved quite a lot of classroom-based learning, anatomy and physio physiology, and he loved it. He also got to learn to fly gliders, did one trip to Malta to help evacuate a casualty, but was mainly based around the UK at RAF Henlow and RAF Benson. Chris did his national service from 1952 to 55, and that inclu includes the coronation of Elizabeth II. While Roger managed to get a job selling programmes right outside Westminster Abbey, Chris was stationed in Kensington Gardens and didn't see anything as he was manning a first aid tent. During his time in the RAF, he was confirmed in the Church of England by the Air Force chaplain. His quiet faith was a constant through the rest of his life. Returning from the RAF, he worked again at Sainsbury's, taking on the role of first aider in whichever store he worked, and thus started a relationship with St John Ambulance, which was to last over 60 years. He also went back to 9th A's Hair Scouts, where both he and Roger were warranted officers, Chris taking on the role of teaching knots and first aid and earning that title doc. They took many boys on camping trips, where you'd load all the camping equipment on the back of the lorry and then load the kids on top. On Christmas Eve 1955, Roger had a motorbike accident. He suffered multiple injuries and died on Boxing Day. He was 25 years old. Chris had just turned 22. That was one of the most pivotal days of his life and it was never the same again. His love for his brother did not diminish but grew over the years and I know it is a great sadness for Beryl and the rest of the family that we never got to meet him. And all generations since have known that the way to a broken dad or granddad's heart would have been to learn to ride a motorbike. After Roger's death, Chris continued working for Sainsbury's and leading the ninth hair Hayes Air Scouts, but in 1963 his life would change again. He was moved to the Hayes store, and maybe without that move some of us would not be here today. One of Dad's jobs was to take the day's takings to the local branch of the Midland Bank, and working there was a young cashier called Beryl. He always claimed that he would get in her queue as she was the fastest at counting the notes. I'm sure the fact that she looked like the young queen had nothing to do with it. 
Coming up to Christmas 1963, Beryl didn't have a partner for the works Christmas do. I'm going to ask that handsome young man from Sainsbury's if he will take you, said one girl. You wouldn't dare, said my mother. And the rest, they say, is history. After that bank do the, on their first date, they went to the Christmas party at Ninth Hayes. In 1965, they were married at King's Hall Methodist Church, and there are some people here today who shared that special day with them. Beryl has often said it was a good thing that her maiden's name started with an S, Stokes, or Christopher wouldn't have been interested at all, as all his other interests started with an S, Stamps, Scouts, Sainsbury's. <laughs> After a honeymoon in Jersey, they set up home in a new build in Winnish, the village that would be their home for the next 56 years, and they started attending this church in Woodley. Richard was born in 67 and me in 69. During those years, Winnish continued to grow and eventually it was big enough to support a scout troop and first Winnish was born. Chris was involved early on and I'll leave others to talk about that time because in those days girls weren't allowed in the scouts. But I do know that his role as teacher of first aid and teacher of knots went with him as well as the title doc. All through this time, his stamp collection was expanding to the extent that it start, he started to buy and sell at stamp fairs and auctions until it took over an entire room of the house. In 1974, Marjorie died and Fred came to live with us, which he did until his death in 76. I know he found the respons Chris found the responsibility of being in effect an only child weighed heavily on his shoulders at this time, and he wished he'd had Roger by his side to help shoulder the load. After Fred died, the house in Watmore Lane was too big a financial responsibility, so they took in lodgers, first university students from Reading, then professional people looking for digs when moving to the area. And then, after Richard and I left home, foster children on a mixture of short and long-term and emergency placements, over 30 young people until they retired from this when Chris turned 70. Although Mum took the major burden of this, he was always that quiet, constant presence and support. Chris worked at the Slough, Reading, Bracknell and Maidenhead Sainsbury's stores, continuing his work of first aider in ever, whichever branch he was working in. As we grew older and we shared tea together, he would come home from work and would often tell us stories of injuries he'd dealt with, which often involved the crushing of fingers or toes. I do remember one incident when Chris had to administer CPR to a young pregnant woman until the ambulance crew arrived, and I remember his sadness when he later heard that she died on the way to hospital. Holiday time was so important as he worked so hard. We often didn't see him from day to day when we were little, and he worked most Saturdays, and he had his day off during the week when we were at school. But we, those holidays were special. We went to some beautiful places in the UK. And although he never went camping with the Scouts, he never took us camping. On holidays, Chris liked to take photos, and I remember when in St Ives, about eight years old, I was allowed to take one photo with his retina camera um, of the harbour. It was only recently that I learnt that this was actually Roger's camera I had been allowed to use because he was the photographer and Chris had taken over from him. Childhood memories include the bottle of Daddy's Magic, a bottle of dilute Savlon that was administered to every childhood injury. Dad playing stamps while we watched the telly, with him asking, where's this stamp from? And where is it printed? And how much is it worth? Which would be followed by searching in the stamp catalogue, and then an atlas to locate Cambodia or St Vincent. And so I thank Dad for my love of maps, but not my love of stamps. I also remember the row of shoes put out for cleaning every Sunday morning. That was his job, while Mum got the roast dinner in the oven. And then, of course, Dad used his skills honed on the deli counter of Sainsbury's to carve the roast joint. I, I remember him being very proud when Richard and I did well in exams and him saying how, how he was sad he was that his parents were not around to see this and to marvel in our success. He was always a constant, quiet, loving presence in our lives. He never shouted at us. There was never, just wait till your father gets home. We just knew that he loved us and we loved him. Pete and I married in this church in 1991. And I will never forget the look on his face when he saw me in his wedding dress, in my wedding dress. 
that quiet pride that spilled over but into his beautiful speech, which was definitely outside his comfort zone. It was Beryl who was a public speaker by then, as she had taken on the role of local preacher in the Methodist church, and he was her greatest supporter, accompanying her to so many, many services within Berkshire and Hampshire. In 1993, he retired, and all those years of hard work and paying into his pension fund paid off, and he and Mum were into able to enjoy nearly 30 years of retirement and some truly wonderful holidays. Fulfilling Beryl's dream to visit her family in Australia, they visited four times, including flying around the world, stopping off in various places, Singapore, South, Heati, South Africa, Tahiti and California, and New Zealand. In later life, they loved to cruise and would always be planning their next trip. And by the end, they'd visited 59 countries and, and everywhere they went, they had to find a cloth badge for him to sew onto his camp blanket. He also amassed a wonderful collection of colourful Hawaiian shirts. And maybe if this had been a summer funeral, we'd have asked you, those not in scout uniform, to wear one in his memory. In 1994, Richard and Shirley married in Sao Paulo in Brazil, a wonderful wedding where we were so welcomed by her family. We also managed to go travelling in Brazil and saw some amazing sights. The Iguazu Falls on the border of Brazil and Argentina definitely made the top places of that Chris had visited in the world. In 1997, four years after his retirement, a branch of Sainsbury's opened in Winnish. No prizes for guessing who was in the very front of the queue when it opened, and we did wonder if he might be tempted to get a part-time job there. But by then, I think he was enjoying retirement too much. In the next few years, grandchildren arrived. Daniel, Debs, Hannah, Joanna, he loved seeing them grow up and excel academically and being given that education that had been denied to him. And he was very proud that he saw them all graduate from university. Having Hannah live with them during that final year of her degree was such a blessing as she was with them when the pandemic hit. They were also able to join us on family holidays in cottages all over England and Wales. And it was so lovely to spend time with them and their, as their grandchildren grew up as we'd often take Hannah and Debs away with us too. One of the things that Chris did when he retired was to take up watercolour painting. And when we'd go on a walk, we would park him and his sketchbook in front of a beautiful view. And we'd come back a couple of hours later to admire his picture and invariably find him telling his life story to a stranger who had stopped to admire the view. All the grandchildren spent time painting with him. And Joanna remembers painting a beautiful picture of Stonehenge with his help. Retirement was full and active, with scouts and stamps and art club <coughs> and holidays, but he also had more time to devote to church activities, and every year he was an important member of the Holiday Bible Club team at Christchurch, running outdoor games in the car park. We were so glad they were able to celebrate their golden wedding in 2020, 2015, and some people here today were able to share with that too. But everything changed about five years ago as his health began to deteriorate. This and then the pandemic reduced what he could do. We were all so pleased when restrictions lifted and were able to meet together to celebrate the wedding of Hannah and James in October 21 and that Chris was able to be there too. But eventually the time came when they needed more help and the sad decision was made to move away from their communities of Winnersh and Woodley to live nearer me in, a, in an assisted living complex in Basingstoke. Lady Susan Court gave them their life back as we came out of lockdowns, coffee mornings, quiz nights and fantastic celebrations for the Queen's Platinum Jubilee and the fact that, that they were so near me meant I could pop in much more often and so could other members of the family. Dad said many times over that they did the right thing by moving, as he saw Mum able to enjoy life more with less pressure. They joined the United, local United Reformed Church in Basingstoke, which they could walk to from Lady Susan. And in September, Neil, Helen, Roger, Nicky and Scott celebrated his 50 years of service to First Winnish Scouts at a service there, and he became an honorary member of the 8th Basingstoke Scouts. Unfortunately, because of his health conditions, we knew it would be an uphill battle if he caught COVID, and even with all the vaccinations that he had. So when he tested positive on the 12th of December, the next few days were very difficult. 
and he died from COVID in the Northampshire Hospital on the 23rd of December. When people have spoken to us over the last few days about Dad and how they will remember him, <sighs> words like loyal, constant, service, duty, calm, quiet are common themes. The fact that hobbies from his childhood, stamps and scouting were still enjoyed to the end, that he worked for the same firm all his working life, that he was married to Beryl for 57 years, loved his family and his faith underlined it all. I'm going to cheat now and finish, if I can get the words out, by borrowing and adapting some words spoken by Queen Elizabeth II at the service to mark her golden wedding to Prince Philip. He has, quite simply, been our strength and stay all these years, and we, his whole family, Sainsbury's and Scouting, owe him a debt greater than he would ever claim, or we shall ever know. On your order of service, you'll find a link to the much-loved tribute page. We would really love you to share your memories of Chris with us on that website. Thank you. As you've all just heard, we have come together because Christopher John Wooten, Doc as he is known to many of us, has died and the life that we shared with him has come to an end. This is a time of parting, loss and sadness. All of us who knew Chris had a unique relationship with him. Death does not bring to an end his influence, nor the love and respect in which he was held during his life. They will continue to be powerful for as long as he is remembered. Chris was made in the image of God, and he was baptised into the Christian family of faith. Every moment of his life was a dearly loved child of God. His death does not alter God's love for him. He bears God's name and is lovely in the eyes of God who created him. At the heart of, the death, at the heart of death, there is mystery. There is much we cannot know or understand. Death marks for every person the boundary between the life God gives us in this world and the new life God gives us beyond death. We stand on this boundary, not knowing what lies beyond our seeing, our hearing or our imagining. Yet by faith we grasp God's promise declared in the resurrection of Jesus that we shall not die into oblivion but shall all be changed even in sorrow. We are empowered by the Holy Spirit working in our hearts to say thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Lord, it is your love that gave us life, and it is your love that welcomes us through death. It is your presence that gives us hope, and your almighty power that gives us assurance, and your endless love that gives us the courage to continue the journey of life, putting our trust in you. Lord, we praise you because you are greater than anything we can imagine more caring than we can ever understand and your love is reaching out to hold us in ways that give us hope comfort and peace lord we praise you that we can turn to you when our faith is weak and when it is strong when we are full of questions doubts and fears and when our faith is firm and our trust is in you Lord, we do not always find it easy to make room for you in our busy lives. We do not always find it easy to recognise your presence. We do not always find it easy to trust, to believe or to have faith. Lord, we know that you will accept us as we are, that you will meet our needs and share our pain. We come with our praise in Jesus' name the one who opens the way into the presence of the Father. 
Amen. And now if I could ask Daniel to come and give us our reading. I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Thank you. Maggie has spoken about Chris, and now it's my turn to talk about Doc. For whilst both are the same person, and his personality and rootedness in God are seen in every aspect of Chris's life, including his scouting. There are parts of Doc's life that were shared so generously with all of us in his scouting family that maybe were not seen by his family so much. For example, you remember what Maggie said about him never going camping with the family. Yet so many of my memories come from being on camp with Doc. It is also at this point that I would normally give a sermon and reflect both on Doc's life and the passage that we've just heard in the Bible. I might have talked about how Psalm 121 is sometimes called the Traveller's Psalm. It was a psalm sung by pilgrims as they made their annual journey to Jerusalem. It expressed their faith in God, but also reflected the unease they felt about travel. I look to the mountains. Where will my help come from? Mountains may be beautiful, but they could also be dangerous. Mountains are places where people lose their lives. The authorised version, I think, was wrong when it changed that first statement, that first verse into a statement. The authorised version says, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. The version we've just heard, thankfully, says it differently. Because the hills are not the place from which help comes. Rather, they are the place where help is needed. Here in the Psalms, the hills or the mountains represented the perils of the journey. For it was in the ravines and the gorges of the mountain ranges that wild beasts and robbers hid. As the pilgrims looked to the mountain ranges that they had to cross if they were to reach Jerusalem, they were filled with foreboding and wondered from where will their help come? It is in this situation that the psalmist declares, my help will come from the Lord who made heaven and earth. What was true then remains true today. As we go through the ups and downs and twists and turns of our life's journey, we travellers need to remember that God is there to help if we will but let him. God doesn't force himself upon us but he is there if we will turn to him. God doesn't guarantee that difficulties will never occur, but he does promise that when trouble arises, he will be right there. That's how I might have started such a sermon, and that would have reflected Doc's beliefs and the example that he laid out for all of us in the life that he lived. Doc, as we heard, had a number of lifelong passions, and scouting is right there in the middle of it. Doc took a promise when he was 14, and he lived his life in line with that promise. Later in the service, those of us who are scouts, or who have been scouts, will be making our promise here in front of all of you. And as I make that promise, I'll be remembering the example that Doc has given me and so many people. Part of that promise is to keep the scout law. And it's there that I wish to start this reflection on scouting and a life in scouting. For a lot of us, it was Doc that took us through the beginnings of our scout days and taught us about the scout promise and the scout law. And just before I talk about that scout law in more detail, I'd just like to quote another piece of another psalm, Psalm 119, verses 33 to 35. Teach me, O Lord, the meaning of your laws, and I will obey them at all times. Explain your law to me, and I will keep it with all my heart. 
Lead me into your commandments, because in them I find happiness. The scout law is rooted in the Bible. The scout is, a scout is to be trusted. But we take thought beforehand and aim to be honest and absolutely above suspicion, not only in the sight of God, but also in the sight of men. 2 Corinthians 8.21 A scout is loyal. Proverbs 19.22 What is desired in a man is loyalty. A scout is friendly and considerate. Proverbs 18.24 Some companions are good for only idle talk. But a friend may stick closer than a brother. A scout has courage in all difficulties. The Lord is my light and my salvation. I will fear no one. Psalm 27 verse 1. A scout makes good use of time and is careful of possessions and property. Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithfully managing small amounts. I will put you in charge of large amounts. Come in and share my happiness. Matthew 25, verse 23. A scout has self-respect and respect for others. Now, this law as we have it now used to be broken down into many more, and I want to share the ones that Doc would have known when he first took that promise, that, that promise and took the law. A scout is courteous. Finally, be all of one mind, compassion for each. Love as brothers, be courteous. 1 Peter 3, 8. A scout is kind. You should try your hardest to supplement your faith with brotherly kindness. A scout is helpful. Where will my help come from? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Back to that psalm we've just heard. And the final piece of our law, a scout belongs to the worldwide family of scouts, which is something Christopher knew very well. Uh, and we'll talk about his worldwide scouting when we, a little bit further. Chris didn't use the Bible when he did his sessions on the scout law and the promise with young people. Instead, in his quiet and engaging way, he sat small groups down and he talked with them. He asked them questions and he listened to their answers. He then helped guide their thoughts. But the bigger lesson was in his example. He lived his life in a way that showed us all just what it meant to follow the promise and abide by the scout law. I personally only had the pleasure of knowing Doc in his latter years after he had retired and his role in scouting was that of a helper. But I can say a few things about Doc from my own reflections. The first being that I've never seen a more dedicated volunteer. Doc used to attend every section. He would be there for Monday beavers, then stay on and do scouts. Tuesday cubs, Wednesday cubs, and then Thursday beavers and scouts. And if we were doing something on a Sunday or a Saturday, he'd come to that. I don't know when he had time to see Beryl or do his scouts, do his stamps, because he was always at scouts with us. He was also there to support the adults, give us a quick word of encouragement if we were struggling, always able to step in and talk to the group if things did not go to plan, thus allowing the leaders to regroup. Usually, if he did happen to step in for us, he would talk about something to do with health or something not related. But actually, Doc could talk about anything. And whatever, we were, whatever that meeting was, if we'd gone wrong, Doc could just step in and talk. And the scouts would, whatever was happening, they'd stop, they'd listen, and they'd really show him some respect. Talking of knots, he always had some rope with him. And there would be young people going to show him what they had mastered or asking him to teach them more. In my early years, when it was just Roger, Doc and myself on camp with 20 boys, Doc would take responsibility for the scouts in the evening, every evening, so that Roger and I could have a few hours off. But before he released us to go find the adult-only space, he would first have a wander around the camp. We'd explore the gateways and the sights and the sounds with Doc. Those camps were big camps. We used to go to international camps with four or 5,000 people there. And Doc really enjoyed being able to just take a gentle walk, a gentle reflection, and time to refill his cup. What probably Roger and I didn't realise was that was actually an opportunity for him to help us refill our cups. And since 
going on camp with Doc. Whenever I go on a big camp now, I always take that time in the early evening just to have a quick walk, a quick wander, a bit of peace and quiet. And it's something that I think Doc has instilled in me that will stay there forever. Um, in speaking to other members of First Winnish Scouts and some of the parents that I know, that I've known from the last 15 years, one of the facts about Doc that has shone through and that was touched upon by Maggie earlier is his ability to talk to anyone and make them feel welcome and at ease. Roger and I both agreed that we often felt guilty as Doc used to do one of our main jobs as group scout leader. If anyone came to the doors, he would be there first. Even if it was at the beginning of the meeting, during the meeting, at the end of the meeting, Doc would be the first person to go and greet them. He'd say hello, he'd give them a gentle smile, and he'd start to talk about scouts, about the group. He'd ask questions about themselves. And before you knew it, he was converting new volunteers. He had a way of making people feel important and welcomed. I can't exactly explain it, I just hope some of what he gave us as an example might be seen by others in me when they reflect upon my life sometime in the future. Doc was also a patient man. I never saw him lose his temper or even raise his voice. An example of his patience would be how he recruited me into First Winnish Leaders. I arrived at the church one Easter. Come the summer, I was making noises that I wanted to be involved in a youth group. I expected I'd end up in the boys' brigades. I'd been a scout, but we had boys' brigades. That's where I expected I'd end up. Doc waited all summer. And at the end of the summer, they hadn't snapped me up. And he came along and had a quiet chat, told me about this scout group that was in real need of leaders. And the rest, as they say, is history. I've only really touched on the Doc that I and those in scouting around me in my time know. But I have no doubt that some of those traits of gentle encouragement and patient teaching and respect for others were there throughout his scouting life, as well as the drive to always make life better for all around him, to make sure that the young people got the best opportunities he could offer them. The official scout records show Doc starting his scouting in 1955 as a leader, which concurs with his memories from a journal that I've had the privilege to have a look at. And now, with time off when he got married, and the time that he was forced to take when he retired, because um, scouting was unenlightened at the time. Um, he effectively would have been a scout leader for 69 years had he not had to take that time off. Even with that time off, it is my understanding, looking at the records, that next year I would have had the privilege of giving him his 60-year service award. I said I could not share memories from when Doc was a leader in his early years, but we are able to have Doc's own memories show us what it was like. And to my scouting friends preparing a trip to Belgium this coming year, I would like to share with you how it used to be done. This is taken from the book that was at the front, and it will be at the front again with, with Doc's stuff for you to have a look at. But I'd like to read just a couple of items from there that Doc himself wrote. Just to share his scouting life. The first is a letter to parents, and it reads, Dear parents, this year it has been proposed that the troop will go on a coach tour for summer camp from the 16th of August to the 30th of August. We are hoping to go to Dover, Ostend, Ghent, Brussels, Luxembourg, Koblenz, Cologne, Dusseldorf, Nijmegen, Arnhelm, Amsterdam, and back through the Hook of Holland. The total distance is about 1,200 miles. The cost is estimated as follows. Fares, £10.50. Food, £3.50. Spending money, £6. Total, £20. Which you must agree is a very reasonable for 14 days on the continent. Please let me know as soon as possible if your son will be coming with us, as there is a limited number of seats available and we will be opening a camp bank from next troop meeting. Yours in scouting, Doc. And this was Doc back in 1958 when he was with the Hayes Scout Group. He then has in this journal a newspaper article, and I'll just read a very small portion of that, and lots of pictures from that trip, which I encourage you to come and look at. 
But this article basically talks about how his troop, Hayes, and a troop from the Midlands went camping together. And the bit I want to share is that their district commissioner came prior to this trip. And this was when Doc got his first wood badge. And it's recorded here in the paper so we can line that up with the information that we have in our scout records. I do commend you to have a look at this book. It will be at the front. And back to his early years at Winnish. In 1998, First Winnish had one leader, Doc. And it was Doc's hard work in holding that group together and then working with Roger that built that group to what it is now. It had one leader. Now it has so many leaders. And that is all because back in the day, Doc recruited people. Doc worked hard to keep that scout group here. And now back to that sermon that I might have given. Were the pilgrim people of God never attacked by robbers? The fact is that God does not allow us to live in some kind of protective bubble. As many of the other Psalms demonstrate, the writer of Psalm 121 knew from his own experience that life can have its ups and downs. However, says the Psalmist, Whatever experiences life may bring, the Lord is there to protect us in the way that really matters. For the Lord will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. He will keep us. Not in the sense that we will not know suffering, but rather he will protect us from the evils that suffering all too easily bring. The evils of bitterness, of cynicism, the evils of complaining, and of despairing. Chris knew that protection in full measure. The psalmist ends with the statement, the Lord will keep your going out and your coming in from this time on and forevermore. I believe that this was particularly true for Chris in the last few years of his life. In spite of all the difficulties associated with his health and the, effect and the effects of the lockdown in protecting his health, God kept Chris positive. He was there for him right up to the end and now has taken him into his eternal kingdom. Yes, in all life's experiences, in its sorrows and its joys, in its failures and successes, and at its beginning and at its ending, God is there to give the help that really counts if we will but open ourselves to him. So today, we give not just thanks for Chris's life, but also for the God who sustained Chris in this life and who continues to sustain him in the next. Amen. And we can now all stand for our second hymn, All for Jesus.
with apologies to Rodyard Kipling. If you can light a fire with soggy matches while standing in a steady stream of rain and see it fizzle out before it catches and hold your tongue and light the thing again. If you can brew, sorry, if you can fix a brew for all your brothers when they are in their blankets, warm and dry, and rather you get wet than all the, the others and laugh when you are tired enough to cry. If you can do, sorry, you can tie a knot that will never fail you and trust it if the worst comes to the worst, to save your life when nothing else awaits you, but put the other fellow's safety first. If you can give first aid to those who need it and treat for shock when you are shaken too, and though you suffer badly, never heed it until you've done the best you can do. If you can go on working when you're weary and go on singing till your throat is dry, if you can meet with sadness and be cheery, and when you fail and just have another try, if you can trust your friends and those about you and yet forgive them if they should forget, and though the whole world sometimes seems to doubt you, be loyal to the task which you are set. If you don't put yourself before the others, and never your patrol before your troop, if you salute all races as your brothers in one united universal group, if you can see the aim and help to win it, and never fail, and so never falter till the job is done, Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. And which is more, you'll be a scout, my son, M. Hill. As we go into our prayers of thanksgiving and prayers of intercession, there is a response on the prayers of thanksgiving. When I say gratefully we come, please reply with longing Lovingly, we give thanks. Gratefully, we come. Lovingly, we give thanks. Gracious God, we entrust Christopher John Wotton into your everlasting care. And as we do so, we thank you again for all he has meant to us. For the person that he has been. For the service he has offered. For the contribution he has made to our lives. Gratefully we come, lovingly we give thanks. We thank you for everything Christopher has meant to his family, to his colleagues and his friends, to us here today. And we thank you for all he continues to mean to you as well as to us. Gratefully we come, lovingly we give thanks. We thank you for Christopher's achievements, which we can look back on with pride. The challenges faced, the obstacles overcome, the successes won, the potential fulfilled. Gratefully we come, lovingly we give thanks. We thank you for the experiences that we have been through together, the love and friendship that we have shared the qualities and characteristics which have made Christopher special to us. Gratefully we come, lovingly we give thanks. We thank you for Christopher's faith, his commitment to Christ, faithful discipleship and personal experience of your love. Gratefully we come, lovingly we give thanks. We thank you for all we owe to Christopher, for the innumerable ways in which he enriched our lives, for the memories we will always have as a lasting tribute and enduring legacy. Gratefully we come, lovingly we give thanks. Gracious God, we come in hope and confidence, trusting in your promise 
and assured of your gracious, gracious purposes. And in that faith we entrust both Christopher and ourselves into your gracious keeping, now and for all eternity. Gratefully we come, lovingly we give thanks. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And as we continue into our prayers of intercession, again, there will be a response. I will say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond with hear our prayer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, as we wrestle now with our grief, we are reminded of all who have lost loved ones, whose lives have been touched by tragedy, and who are overwhelmed by sorrow. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for them in their shock, hurt, and bewilderment. We lift before you their sense of desolation and despair, their feelings of numbness and emptiness, their aching hearts which just see a blank void where so much joy used to be. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for each one of us here today, and especially for those closest to Christopher, for Beryl, Richard, Maggie, Peter, Shirley, Hannah, Daniel, Debs and Joanna, and for the wider family and for Doc's scouting family. Reach out and encircle them in your loving arms. Grant them the comfort you have promised to all who mourn. Your peace that passes understanding. Your light that reaches into the darkest places of life and beyond into the darkness of death. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, may the hope of the gospel the experience of your love and the support of family and friends bring the help that is needed at this time, the strength to endure sorrow in all its intensity and to face death in all its apparent finality, yet ultimately to look forward in faith, knowing that in Christ nothing can finally separate us from you or from those we love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. And now we're coming close to the end of the service, and I said that there'd be a scout promise. For all those who have taken a scout promise in the past, anyone who wishes to retake it now in memory of Doc, please stand and make the scout sign. It doesn't matter if you're not in uniform. It doesn't matter if you think that you left scouts years ago. If you've taken the promise, Doc would say you are a scout for life. If you wish to retake it, please join me now. On my honour, I promise that I will do my best to do my duty to God and to the King, to help other people and to keep the scout law. Those of you who are stood, you might as well remain standing. For now we shall sing our final hymn. O oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance toward you and give you peace. Amen.